So in the midst of all the serious things that are happening this weekend, there is also something that some people would argue is serious, but it really isn't. Um, and that's the start, official start of the NFL football season, right? So um, to up until this point, uh, if you are, are not a football fan and roll your eyes at all of this, up to this point have been preseason games. And the preseason games are just an opportunity for them to get money from people who want to go and see it because they're so desperate for any sort of football. But the preseason's not good. Like, it's just, it's just not good. And to start start it off, they always start off with a special Hall of Fame celebration, all right? So the Hall of Fame celebration uh, in Canton, Ohio, has uh, the, you know, they, they make it a big weekend so people come and spend money, and this year they had uh, Tim McGraw come and give a concert, then on Friday, then on the next, on Saturday they had the actual Hall of Fame ceremony, Fred Barr, several people were inducted in the Hall of Fame, and they finished the weekend by having a game at the stadium there in Canton, Ohio, at the first preseason game of the season. Now, here's the problem, is the concert on Friday and the ceremony on Saturday were both on the field. So once the ceremony on Saturday is done, they've got to get the field ready for Sunday in the football game, right? So they, you know, you you at least probably have seen a football field, and you know they, you know they they paint the end zones and they paint right in the middle, right? So they they did. Now this is the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Just as we continue in the story, just remember they painted their amazing design. Oh, ah, right in the middle of the field, and uh, as people were on the field getting ready they realized there was a problem. See, apparently, whoever it was that was in charge of actually applying the paint to the field used the wrong paint. So the paint wasn't drying, which that would be exciting to play football on that, right? So here's where it, here's where it goes sideways, because this is, a, this is a problem, right? But this is a solvable problem. So here's how they decide to solve the problem, and on, this is all 100% true. They bring heaters out on the field to dry the paint. Now, uh, why is this a problem, you say? Well, see, the green stuff around there isn't grass. This is called field turf which uh, has little pellets, you know, because it's not AstroTurf, which is basically green carpet. This is the next generation. This is fake grass, but it's got little pellets, little, it's got sand underneath and then little pellets of rubber so that you can plant and pivot and turn. And what happens when you apply high heat to rubber? Okay, so you all got there. It started melting into this sort of goopy mess, at which point the next decision, and I promise you this was 100% true, was to apply paint thinner to sort of wipe it all off and start again. Once, they, once they've applied it, somebody looks on the side of the can and goes, may be harmful if it comes in contact with skin. And so they go, huh. And apparently, it didn't even wipe the paint off. It just created this goopy, tar-like substance. So you have this sort of, uh, you know, committee thing of all these people standing around kind of staring at this and you know this game was going to be broadcast on ESPN this is you know people have paid all this money to come and be a part of it and they have to cancel the game because they have created this uh, toxic soupy tar like substance in the middle of the football field okay now, this is a funny story to tell just to tell the funny story, but I'd say this because their focus became solely on fixing this, fixing the paint, right? The focus became solely on fixing the paint. So they made a bad decision about the paint and putting the paint on the field. That happens. We all make bad decisions. But the next step, as you well know in your life and in the lives of those all around you, is the first mistake isn't the problem, right? What's the problem? It's the next one, right? And then the next one, and the next one. And so when you keep doubling down 
on the problem. When you focus in so much and decide the issue is fixing the paint, you wind up with a situation where everything turns sideways. What's the real, what was the real goal of this group? What was the real goal here? Play a football game, right? They could set up markers, they could do all kinds of stuff, it doesn't matter about this. But the problem is, the focus got zoomed in so much on this that they missed the bigger goal and, and completely missed the bigger idea of what was going on. Here's why we're talking about that. Because we are starting, some, we are starting a big, long, it's not really a sermon series, it's more a journey that we are beginning. Today, through the school year, we are starting a narrative journey. And what we are doing is we are going to be looking at all of Scripture. We're, you know, we're very good at, at picking, up, picking up the Bible and zooming in very closely on two or three verses. And we spend 20 or 30 minutes talking about that. And then next week, we come here, we pick up the Bible, we zoom in on two or three verses, and we talk about that. What we sometimes don't do is take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Look at where we're going. Look at how, look at the journey that God is inviting us to as we look at Scripture. Because, and you know this, you can get so zoomed in on this that you miss the bigger picture of what God would have you to do. You know Christians that are about as far from loving as you could possibly imagine, right? And what did Jesus say? They'll know us by our love, right? That seems pretty clear. But when, uh, in a pretty famous study a few years ago, uh, a, a you know, sort of random group of non-Christians were asked, what sort of words would you use to describe Christians? Here are the two responses. Now, these numbers are the number of people who said that word. 87% of non-Christians, when they were asked, what word would you use to describe Christians, use the word judgmental. Now, if you're like me, the first response is, well, how dare they do that? You know what's wrong with them? And then I sort of prove their point, right? The second response to that is, if I'm really, really honest, maybe I need to spend some time there. And the second piece here is hypocritical. Now again, our first response may be, oh, yeah, well, what about those people who responded to that survey? You know, again, okay. What if we spend a minute here, and without calling them into question or calling them names or disparaging them, what if we spend a minute thinking about where is their fault in the Christian church if these are the responses that we have? Right? How have we taken this book seriously, apparently so seriously to the point that when other people see us, instead of seeing us as people who love, not that we have to just sort of you know, lay down for whatever, but, but that we can't even say what we believe in a loving way. Because there are people who you don't agree with, who you believe are still loving and friendly toward you, right? Right? There are people who don't believe the same things you believe that you can still go out to dinner and not throw rolls at them. There are, there are people who don't have to believe the exact same thing that you believe, and yet we can still be friendly. 87% of these people said the word judgmental, and 85% said hypocritical. And the argument I am making is that some of us, Christians, have zoomed in so much on specific words in here that we have missed the bigger image and missed the bigger spirit of what God's called us to do. So, what's the solution? We don't get rid of the Bible. The Bible is still core and central to who we are and what we understand about who, what, we, what we live and how we go. But what we do, what we do is we zoom out. Because if you want to make sure that you get to the destination that you want to go to, then you check your progress every so often. 
For some of us, when we are driving, we have Google Maps or whatever up all the time. Other people have this sort of sense, but we are checking our progress of where we're going. So we are zooming out and looking at this broad picture of what Scripture is. We are going to be looking at how God moves and speaks and how God has done it from the beginning. So if we start over here at the very beginning, what you get when you zoom out, you see a cohesive a cohesive narrative line of the story of God. So you begin, that we'll talk about here in a minute, at the very beginning. And it, it builds and it builds all the way through up into what we believe the apex is in Jesus. Alright? So all of this is building up to Jesus. And the rest of the narrative, when you, you know, starting the Gospels on, it comes down like this because what you find is that everything that, that we do over here, we are constantly looking back to Jesus. We are constantly looking back. The end of all things is right here. So the New Testament sort of does this. There's this sort of gap right here, and then there's the end. Okay? This gap is where we live. We are a part of the story. We are in the midst of what is happening, so we get to help write the narrative. And right now, we're not writing a very good story, right? But, like all good stories, you start with the problems and you start with the conflict, because you can't have the great turnaround if you don't have the problems to begin with. So, we see the, all of this huge narrative when we look at Scripture and we find how we fit in it and we find what God has been doing. And one of the things that happens is when we start over here and see that from the very beginning, God was working and moving and planning. This wasn't something that God just sort of, uh, you know, the deadline was this day, so he just sort of threw something out there. This was God's plan and God's work. And so from the very beginning, God's desire that we read, if you were to open up your Bible to the very, turn past the table of contents, and you get Genesis 1. The very beginning. Genesis 1 and 2, these dual creation stories of how God is working and moving and creating all things. Where there was nothing, where there was darkness, where there was disorder, God brings all things into light, into life, and into love. God then decides in this beautiful, beautiful passage that God is lonely. And God creates people. God creates man and woman in God's image. Now, what I talked about with the kids a few minutes ago was this idea of icons. And we, you, know, you all may be more familiar with icons than they are. It's more a computer thing is how we use it, right? But you, know, you click on the little icon and the program launches. Or it doesn't. But, you know, you click on it, you just keep clicking on it, hoping something happens, right? So this icon that, that what God has invited us to be from the very beginning is a representation, a picture, so that when people see us, they are launched into this bigger image of who God is and how God, has, how God works and operates and lives. That in seeing us, in seeing humanity, people uh, are drawn in to a bigger and a better, a richer, a more full understanding of who God is. But right here at the very beginning, problems happen. That in the midst of this celebration and this peace and this beauty, there comes the immediate and terrible struggle. So let's turn, if you will, with me. To Genesis chapter 3. If you are using the Bible in the seat underneath you, which you are invited to do if you don't have your own, it is on page 3. So, Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may, eat we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it 
or you will die. <laughs> you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, The woman you put here with me, she, she gave me some of the fruit from it, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. All right, so, and then it goes on to all of the different problems that happen because of that. But here's, for, for some of you, this is a story that you may have heard over and over and over, and you have, may have heard all sorts of different interpretations and understandings, and it's, you know, fill in the blank for whatever you want. But what I'd like us to focus on is this question right here that the serpent asks. Is... Um, you know what? Can you, can you eat from, from anything you want? And Eve says, well, sure, absolutely. Well, except for that one. God said, don't, don't eat from that one. Because then you'll die. And the serpent goes, <laughs> you won't die. You know what the problem is, right, Eve? N no. See, the problem is, God wants to keep all that good stuff for himself. And I can't believe you're okay missing out on that. I can't believe you're okay missing out on that. I can't believe you don't want to be godlike. See, the role that back here God had given to Adam and Eve, to all people, was that they were icons. When people saw them, what they did is it resonated with who God was and how God worked, that they were to be rulers underneath God. They were to be rulers, but in structure underneath God. And what the serpent asks over here is, why, why are you okay with this? Why are you okay being underneath God when one bite you could be just like God? And see, this is the, uh, this is the distinction here. And this is the piece that trapped Eve and, if we're honest, traps us a lot. Scott McKnight, the uh, biblical scholar, New Testament scholar, uh, points this out where he says, the question and the challenge that the serpent asks is, do you want to be God-like? Or are you content just being under God? How Scott McKnight puts it is, the, the challenge and the, the question for Eve and then for Adam and then for us is, are you okay being godly? Filling the role God has for you, doing the thing God's called you to do, being the icon that represents and that shows who God is and how God works in the world, or would you rather be God-like? And man, I, you know, when the preacher asks it, obviously there's a right answer, but if we're honest, we don't like anybody to be the boss, right? Right? We don't like anybody to tell us what to do. We don't like anybody putting us in any sort of box that contains us and keeps us in, even if it's for our own good, even if it is for our own health. We just rail against that, right? We're the little kid who doesn't understand why you can't put the fork in the light socket because it looks so cool, and why would the holes be right there on the wall if you didn't, and why would forks be like this if they weren't supposed to go in there, right? We don't understand what's the, why, why on earth is that the way? And the serpent says, you can be God-like. You don't have to just settle for being godly. What a rush that is. 
What an ego trip that is, to be the one that decides everything in our own lives, to be the one that is in charge, to be the one who is calling the shots. And so before we give Eve too hard a time, and we really should give Adam a pretty hard time too, because the first time the pressure hit, what was the very first thing he did? Just chucked her right under that bus, right? He could not have thrown her further. So before you give them too much, too much grief, Look in your own heart and see what your answer would be. Of course, we want to say we would be godly, that we trust God and God's in charge and we believe all that. But there's this sense where we want to be in control. There's a sense where we believe we can do it better. And there's a sense where we don't want somebody else stepping in and telling us what to do. That to be godlike has this power attached to it that we can't help but, but see and believe that this is too good. This is what we are called for. This is who we are called to be. And this is when sin enters the world. This is when the relationship between God and humanity breaks. And this is this irreparable damage, at least it seemed at the time, where the icon no longer represents God. The icon is broken. Our role as showing people the way to who God has called us to be no longer works. No matter how many times you click on it, it's not launching. We are broken. We are no longer connected to God, the bigger truth and the bigger reality. And so we are on our own. And very quickly, just like Adam and Eve, when we decide to be godlike instead of godly, we very quickly see that this is not a job we are either qualified for or enjoy having. And it doesn't take us very long before we have driven the car into the ditch and have had a real problem. Adam and Eve realize that they are naked. Adam and Eve are ashamed. Adam and Eve want to hide from God. Because they realize the truth of who God is and who they are. They realize the understanding of what they are called to be and how they have messed that up. And it will cost them dearly. The rest of this rise up, the rest of this rise up to Jesus is God trying to woo God's people back. God trying to bring people back and saying, come back to me, follow me, don't choose to be God-like, choose to be godly. And people over and over and over reject it. And God sends Jesus. God's own son, to come and to teach and to live and to die and to rise again so that it is not on our own, but it is through God's grace and love and mercy that we are reconnected. Because it is not of our own power and our own will that when people see us, they see God, right? When you think about the most important people in your life, maybe the, the holiest people in your life, these aren't people who are proud or boastful. These aren't people who are making sure everybody knows what they've done. These are people who, when you see them, they can't help but launch you into a bigger understanding of God, of who God is, of how God works. Every time you see them, it is as if you are seeing the kingdom of God walking around with skin on, right? This is what God calls each of us to be, but it's only through Jesus that we find this. Because the temptation we have, and, and what the writer Ann Voskamp says, is our fall was, has always been, and always will be, that we aren't satisfied with God and what God gives. See? When the serpent comes to Eve, she thinks God's holding back. Otherwise, why would you eat the fruit, right? God's good enough right here and now. I have everything that I need. But what if there's something more? What if God may be holding back on me? Maybe I need to go check it out and see. The temptation for all of us is to be godlike, to believe that God may not have our best interests in heart, to hear that, that serpent whisper in our ear and to say, are you really going to let God keep you from the good stuff you could have? It is a temptation as real today as it must have felt back then. It is a temptation that resonates as much with us, if we are honest, that we can be godlike, that we can be focused on what we want and our agenda, and God can fit into that. When in reality, 
We are called to be godly. We are called to remember who is in charge. We are called to live our best life under the limits and the boundaries and the protections that God gives us. Because there are some boundaries and limits, like when your parent says to you, don't stick the fork in the light socket. Some of those are boundaries and protections and limits for you so that you aren't hurt. Some of them help you go the direction you're supposed to go. It is getting less and less likely, I have to admit, one of the boundaries, it seems for me, is that I'm not going to be the starting first baseman for the Atlanta Braves anytime soon. Maybe after this year I have a chance, but most, of the, most years I do not have an opportunity. But one of the boundaries on me are the kinds of jobs, the kinds of possibilities, the kinds of places that open up. The same for you. We can, we can hurt and yearn and wish for something that is different, but where God has placed us and where God has, has bounded us gives us the opportunity to serve and to proclaim and to share the good news of Jesus in our own way. But the challenge that started so many years ago and resonates even today is what will we choose? Will we choose to be God-like having our own way, forcing our own thing, making sure that everybody does what we say with only the boundaries we believe in. Or, we choose to be godly. Believing and trusting that the good news of Jesus is good news for all of us. Believing and trusting that God has God's best intention for us, and all we have to do is follow. The serpent is whispering in your ear. How will you respond? Will you pray with me? We thank you, God, for Scripture that teaches and challenges and shows us new truth each and every day. We thank you, God, for this community of faith where we can gather and learn together. And we thank you, God, most of all for Jesus. We know the evil that is in the world. We have seen evil, God. This morning we remember such evil from 15 years ago. But we know that evil exists all days, everywhere. And so, God, we pray that in the midst of the struggle and the evil and the sin, we will cling to Christ, we will serve God, and we will be icons, proclaiming the good news and the new kingdom of God. In Christ's name, amen.